Good evening and welcome to the Virtual Artist Cafe. From canvases to curations to couture and community, everything is open for discussion. This event is produced by the Baltimore Office of Promotion and the Arts, the city's Arts Council, Event Center, and Film Office. I'm Jackie Downs, Director of the Arts Council for Baltimore City, and I'm delighted to have you all joining us this evening. Tonight's talk will feature Larry Osei Mensa, a curator and cultural critic who uses contemporary art and culture as a vehicle to redefine how we see ourselves and the world around us. Osei Mensa is also the co-founder of Art Noir, a global collective of culturalists who design multimodal experiences aimed to engage this generation's dynamic and diverse creative class. Osei Mensa currently serves as guest curator at BAM's Rudin Family Gallery. He also will be co-curating with Omsk Social Club's 7th Athens Biennial in Athens, Greece in spring of 2021. Stephen Towns. Stephen is a painter and fiber artist whose work explores how American history influences contemporary society. His work has been exhibited locally and nationally, including solo exhibitions at the Baltimore Museum of Art, artist Mark Bradford's nonprofit Art and Practice, based in Lamert Park, Los Angeles, and Gallery Mertice, as well as group exhibitions at Jack Shenman Gallery, The School, August Wilson Cultural Center, Arlington Art Center, and the Star Spangled Banner Flag House and Museum. His work has been featured in publications such as the New York Times, Art Forum, American Craft Council Magazine, and the Baltimore Sun. His new solo exhibition, A Songbird Remembered, will be opening at the DeBuck Gallery in October of 2020. It is my pleasure to introduce to you all, to the cafe, Larry and Stephen. Hey. Hey, how are you? <laughs> good, how are you? I'm good, good. Um, I'm, I'm excited for us to be talking, you know, in public. We've had a couple conversations in private. Um, but first I wanna um, just give a shout out uh, to the Baltimore Office of Promotion and the Arts, Jackie, Kirk, Kyrie, and the team for putting this together. Um, and thank you, Stephen, for making time to chat because um, your name is a name that's been buzzing around for years. And uh, you know to finally just have an opportunity to talk about you, your practice, um, your ideas, what you're interested in, and share that with a broader audience, I think is always a blessing and an incredible opportunity. Um, and just for folks who are watching, um, you can put your comments in the chat. If you have any questions, we'll be cherry picking questions throughout the conversation. Um, and you know, the way we're structured is Steve is gonna share images of work that he's made over the years. We'll talk about it, but then we'll also kind of talk about other things related to the practice and just interest. Um, uh, but I think we can queue up the, the share screen Okay. And then I would just like to start just a little bit with background about you, because um, I think that's important for people to know just, you know, where you came from, you know, and how your upbringing, you know, in South Carolina has informed your artistic practice. Um, so I, it, is, this, is it coming up? Let me try um, this. Let's see. Sorry. There we go. There we go. Cool. That works. Uh, so I'm originally from South Carolina, a small town called Lincolnville, which was mm -hmm. a small town started by three black men. Um, and I've been in Baltimore since 2008. So I came during the economic crisis. So that's why this is a weird time now, because I'm sort of triggered. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> after I lost my job in 2008, I came to Baltimore. Um, I was unemployed for like a year and a half. And then... Um, I got a job at MICA, started working there, and I was making my art um, at the same time while I was working. Um, the, I, in South Carolina, I went to University of South Carolina, um, studied art. I didn't get a master's degree, but all the while I was making art. And we had talked about this earlier, like you sort of do what you gotta do. So I was working mm -hmm. odd jobs in and out of uh, retail, restaurants, like factories, hospitals, I sort of done it all. Um, 
And so uh, after I moved to uh, Baltimore and I started working at MICA, um, I learned a lot from students. I learned a lot from staff members, uh, faculty members. Um, I got a lot involved in the community. And at the same time, I was still making work. Um, and the piece that you see here is called Co-Patriot. So I had always done these images of black people with these halos around their face. Um, the the represent showing how, how black people are beautiful, how black people are like spiritual beings. And um, I felt like I sort of uh, experienced my re renaissance sort of right after uh, Freddie Gray had happened here in Baltimore. And am I speaking too much? No, you good. Okay. So after Freddie Gray happened, I had been reading all of these articles on like Facebook and other places talking about how um, millennials felt that slavery did not, does not matter. Um, mm -hmm. And I was thinking about just like race and slavery and how, like, how does that exist? Like that, it, that, that can't uh, matter. Um, and I started like digging into historical documents um, and books. Uh, 12 Years of Slave was a what, important book for me. Um, mm -hmm. Uncle Tom's Cabin, actually reading it and seeing who Uncle Tom was. Um, mm -hmm. And there's this book called Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl by this woman named Harriet Ann Jacobs. Um, and it just, it really informed the work I did and it made me examine how, just the psychology, like how did mm -hmm. the slave master interact with the, the enslaved person? How did the enslaved person interact with the wife and the children. And so um, seeing those dynamics and seeing the dynamics that exist sort of in work environments, mm -hmm. it, it sort of like everything made sense. It all made sense. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think it's interesting because you, you, you consistently talk about how do you use that history and information to look at the contemporary and look at the things that are, you know, shaping our world right now. I mean, these continual unfortunate incidents of violence against black people by, you know, police, you know, overseers, people in the authority. Um, and it's interesting you mentioned Uncle Tom's Cabin because that seems to be a book that everybody has to read in school. But I don't know if it necessarily registers when you're reading it as like, a, I guess, a high school student. Um, I got the cliff notes when, <laughs> I read okay. the cliff notes when I was in school. So, yeah. But I guess... Um, I just want to go back and then come back forward. Uh -huh. What drew you to Baltimore as a city? Because to my understanding, Baltimore's majority black. Um, what was it about that space versus going to Atlanta or it was, just, it was just necessity. I, okay. My sister lived uh, right outside of Baltimore. And so, mm -hmm. and I had a friend that lived in DC. So it was all about like who I knew. And I had people here who were supportive throughout my whole unemployment period so it was it it was just out of this is the only place i could go and i knew i wasn't going to be able to find a job in south carolina like everything i did was sort of exhausted hmm. and then so fast forward so the the unfortunate incident occurs with freddie gray and you have individuals like you know the kanye west of the world who say slavery is a choice um and you decide to do the research and and the but what I think is also interesting about your practice is that you've consistently pulled the beauty out of very triggering, traumatic, ugly, violent histories. Um, why is that the case um, for you? Um, why is that important to kind of pull the beauty? I mean, we look at this piece right here with the two 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 gentlemen with the halo you know, alluding to a very kind of religious, spiritual, uh, artistic gesture. I, I, I just wanna, I wanna take the shame out of it. I, I, I remember watching like Roots when I was young. Um, I grew up in the eighties and nineties and just the shame that goes around with um, knowing that you come from enslaved people, but you don't quite have the history or even the shame of being, not being upper class, being working class or being growing up poor. Like I just, I needed to take the shame out of that. And um, I, sometimes I talk about how like growing up Jehovah's Witness, the focus a lot is on God and the goodness of God. 
and you know humans are sinners and so i wanted to put the human the the spirit of the human as god and a lot of it is just to take out the shame like we shouldn't be ashamed um uh, there's always this idea of like coming from kings and queens and it doesn't matter if you come from a king or queen or if you come from a worker you still matter you're still a human being and so mm -hmm. i wanted to show um that in the work i can skip to this piece this is one of um my first quilts called birth of a nation and um when i was work this is actually my first quilt um and i had worked been working on it after i had finished all of the co-patriot work and mm -hmm. um this is a memorial to my sister two of my sisters owned the cleaning business um mm -hmm. and we would clean for like upper middle class uh white families or office buildings um and my sister always talked about a level of disrespect that she would feel and she would always say like how can you disrespect me when my grandmother literally fed your grandfather mm. um and so that went into i like her saying that like going through rodney king going through oj simpson all of those racial incidents like in like how militant she was, but she couldn't be militant because she was a, a Jehovah's Witness. I, I sort of put all of that in this piece. So um, mm. when you look at it, you see the flag is gently suspended above the ground um, because the flag is never supposed to be desecrated and touch the ground. Um, and the woman's coat is, um, her, her dress has been stained with coffee and tea, um, but the flag is clean. Um, and you can't see it from this picture, but there's these tiny squares in the dress, um, mm -hmm. the patches, and in those patches are like um, frivility and enjoyment and pleasure. And the reason that people were able to have that frivility, enjoyment and pleasure was because there were these people always working in the background. And so I have always been a person working in the background um, and I was just tired of being ashamed of that. Mm. And so is that part, and, and I guess to also piggyback that, um, because you do work traditionally in painting, which you showed in the first image, but you also work in quilting. Um, mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit more about how you arrived to, as, as, at quilting as a way of articulating these artistic gestures? Because typically quilting is associated with women's work. And I think contemporary quilting has been kind of associated with like older white women. And so I guess, can you talk a little bit about what, what, what is it about quilting that captures your imagination, but you also feel is an important way to kind of showcase your art, you know, instigate these conversations? Yeah, I mean, again, it was like out of necessity. I had this envision this envisioned this image and I had tried painting it, I had tried drawing it and it just wasn't working. And I was like, I need to find a way to find a huge flag and I could never find the flag. And I was like, well, I gotta make it. So I went through different YouTube videos trying to figure out how to do it. Um, and my mom was a sewer, she was a quilter. She made our clothes when um, we were kids. Um, and so I went and I got a bunch of her fabric uh, she let me have. Um, and I learned how to quilt using YouTube videos. And it's just been, um, it's something new. It's hard to do. It takes a long time, um, but it's very meditative. And um, the work that I do, I always feel like I'm piecing things together. And so the idea of piecing things together, like me piecing together pieces of history, it goes along with that idea of quilting and I'm sort of um, putting these pieces together to come to this to to this like beautiful object. And again, quilt I didn't again, but sort of like quilting is it's always thought of like a, a an object of warm warmness um, and uh, an object of memories. And that's what I'm always sort of thinking about when I'm making these works, if that yeah. makes sense. But I also view it as an object of communication, right? I mean, there's this kind of coded language that's embedded in these objects that only like a certain few can kind of read. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why I think it's interesting when you, you use 
this modality of working, highlighting specific either personal um, experiences or highlighting things that have historically occurred that you know only might register to Black people or a Black viewer. Um, I find that to be you know really fascinating. Um, and I guess when you're making work, I mean, do you you, you talk about taking away the shame? Um, not wanting to be in the background, but do you also feel that this work is a way for you to honor your ancestors and just kind of the legacy of, you know, black people in this country? Yeah. I, I mean, and I also felt that way um, with some of the paintings that I did. I do a lot of, when I do paintings, I use a lot of archival images. And I remember doing a group of pieces. I don't have a picture of them now, but after I did them and they all hung on the wall, I, I just felt like whatever happened didn't come through me. And, mm. and every time that I would be in a space with those objects, those, those faces, um, I felt like they were sort of, could, it sounds weird to say, but they were communicating to me. Like I, mm. I am able to tell their story. And when people like have those objects, they are also able to share those stories with other people. Um, mm. Can we, can we scroll back to the image before this? Can you talk uh, to us a little bit about this piece? Um, this is, I wish it were so easy. The idea mm -hmm. of voting um, and voting rights and all of the sort of sacrifices um, that people in the past have done, uh, particularly black people, so that we can vote um, and that we should take voting seriously. Um, Growing up Jehovah's Witness, Jehovah's Witnesses are not supposed to vote. They're not supposed to take part in any sort of governmental activity or join the military. So all of that was sort of new to me once I left school. Uh, I mean, I graduated and went to college and that's when I was like able to vote for and, and realize the importance of voting. And it wasn't until I studied this history sort of later on in my late 20s that I realized that there was this whole history of violence um, because of voting and that um, it's very important um, that we do it. Because I know even now, I mean, it seems like, well, is this really going to matter? Um, but it does. Um, and um, it's well, been, I, I, 2020 I, I, I has been a trying year and I have to convince myself that this does matter. <laughs> And that but I how do you, how do you, when you go into the studio, you know, we're 2020 and I mean, beyond COVID and whatever other things have happened, how do you stay motivated and excited? And like, you know, you, 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 you obviously grew up religious. So like, how do you maintain the faith that your practice can, you know, be this tool for communication and optimism and inspiration, but then I think also awareness. Uh, yeah, we had talked about this earlier. I, like I mm. actually, when COVID happened, like late February, beginning of March, is I couldn't do that. Like I couldn't mm. have the motivation. I was working. I'm work. I was working on a series of um, paintings around mining um, in the early 1900s. And just like learning about the injustices that happened between the coal miners and the companies and how money and economy was used to break up ethnicities um, and pit people against each other. Like I was seeing what was happening now in, in the present from in what was happening in the past. Like so many things were happening that I, it was just, and it just got to be too much. So for like three months, like March, April, May, like I couldn't make anything. I just, I ate lots of ice cream, lots of potato chips and watched lots of 90 Day Fiance and Netflix. Like it was just like, and so it wasn't, and something happened. I can't remember exactly what happened, but it was a spark. Um, I started rereading a book by, uh, about Harriet Tubman and I had to make, I, I, it inspired me to make a piece, um, this piece here. And then I was like, I have to make work again. 
mm-hmm. my my spirit needs to tell these stories and these people this history is here to heal me and so it's so uh, uh i'm just sort of realizing it now like she came to me to heal me at this very mm. moment mm. and then could you talk a little bit because you we, we talked earlier about the importance of um i think you said being gentle with yourself or forgiving yourself or something like that um because i know that we probably have a number of artists who are watching this can you talk about you know, navigating that moment where you couldn't make work and, you know, you were just living, I guess. And, and you know, you were struck by the inspiration, but like the importance of not beating yourself up. Um, Cause I think that's usually the natural tendency. So can you talk a little bit about that in regards to COVID? But I think even like the moments where you were working at Micah, but still, you know, grinding in the studio. Yeah. I mean, I be, I beat myself up. I I I be, beat myself up a lot during uh, the last, at the beginning of COVID, and feeling guilty for not feeling inspired. And you would see people making work and talking about grinding and grinding. And it's like, well, I I don't have that in me right now. Um, and I would go through periods of like that um, when I was working too, because like we had talked about before, like I spent my life working. One of the, uh, I worked at Walmart. I worked in a factory putting machine parts together. Um, I worked in a hospital in dirty operating room, like crazy stuff. And so it was hard for me to keep motivated. Um, but I knew that I had to do my work because that helps me keep my sanity. I know that I have to work with my hands and create objects because that helps me sort of realize um, what art is to me and why it is so important to me. Um, While I was working at MICA, like a lot of that stuff I was doing was not based in art. A lot of it was just managing budgets, running a grants program. um, And then I would have to do my artwork in the evenings or on the side. It was a very hard and trying time. But I think the the important thing is that I had people around me. I had my husband uh, with me to sort of keep me motivated and remind me of my talents and and that I can keep doing this. I don't know if I didn't have the people that supported me like him, like Kirk, like I would, I don't know if I would be where I am right now. Mm. Mm. So I guess Um, the thing is like surrounding yourself with people who, who believe in you because sometimes you just can't believe it you just don't believe in yourself mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. no i mean that's an important point i mean i think particularly given the circumstances of the last couple of months it's just like you really realize who's your tribe who's in your inner circle who really supports you um mm-hmm. to help you push through um i want to pivot a little bit to talking about process because I'm looking at this this piece right now um, and I'm just wondering how do these quilts come to be? Do they start as a sketch? Do you lay it out? Um, what's the process in creating the quilts? Um, is that different from how the paintings are created? Um, are these coming from imagination? Um, can you talk to us a little bit about that? I think they sort of all come in the same way. They always start out with a sketch, an idea. Like I have an idea of what I want to um, create and then I sketch it out and then it sort of happens through that. Um, One of the things that I was thinking about is like my ideas and where my ideas come from. Mm -hmm. And my ideas come from the 20th century. My ideas come from the algorithm. Like they come Mm -hmm. from me going to Amazon, getting this book and Amazon saying, well, you might like this book or Google saying you might like this book. And it's that last book on the Amazon wish list or and it's like, okay, I'm not going to really read it. But it's all right. It's like I learned something from one book. Um, I learned from the algorithm. You might like this podcast. And so listening to podcasts, so they all sort of come out of those ideas. Um, in those books, they come out as sketches. Um, and then there are larger drawings that I use as patterns to create um, the works. So 
the thing about my paintings, like these paintings, based off of um, stories from the works project it's administration, is that is that they're not just paintings. They're um, the dresses out of fabric. There are buttons in it. There, um, the hat is made out of fabric, um, and I'm still piecing those things together. So just like I have to piece the quilt together, and it all sort of has to be organized and it has a process to it, um, that's exactly how I've taken um, my quilting to. And, I'm and I've am and i started applying it to a lot of my painting. And just a practical question, because you have that fabulous fabric behind you that made me jealous when I had to pull out <laughs> my San for biggest piece. How do you <laughs> select fabric? Because I think about fabric just like it would be paint in terms of palette and telling a story within a story? How do you make those choices um, when you're creating something? Do you have like, you know, reservoir fabrics you could choose from? Um, yes. When you become a quilter or somebody that works in fiber arts, you become a hoarder. So I, but I also have like a favorite spot, uh, Scrap Be More here in Baltimore, where I get a lot of fabrics and people sort of nine, like my, know my style. So People that know me, they're like, oh, you like that old timey style. So they'll hold things for me to see or stuff that's sparkly and brilliant. Like they hold that for me so that I can get it. So I, I sort of have a style that I go for um, and then I go places to find it. And a lot of times I have to go to like rural quilt shops. Um, and we were talking about like the stress of that. Like I am this big black man going in the space by that's mostly sort of occupied by older white women. And I have to build myself up and build my esteem up and my energy up to sort of walk in the space. The walk and maneuver in such a way so that I am safe in that space and mm -hmm. let people know that I am non-intimidating. Um, and then then I am, and I usually show a picture of what I'm doing so people can say, oh, that's beautiful. And then it, the process of shopping in, shopping in these shops becomes easier. But did I answer your question? I yeah, yeah, no. Okay, I mean, okay. But I wonder, like, is there camaraderie amongst quilters or is it, you know, there, uh, yes, quilters, I will say this, is that once you are in the quilt community, quilting is some of the most, um, they're giving, they're giving with their um, talents, they're giving with their knowledge. Like all you have to do is figure, Google something and you'll see somebody on a forum that has explained how to do it. Or you go into a shop and you say, I don't know how to do this and they'll tell you, Oh, I know this person that knows how to do that. Or you should try this machine. Like for um, when you look at some of my earlier quilts, they look completely different than my newer stuff. And it's because of what I've learned from other quilters and the, uh, and the machines that I have to invest in to make the work. I could never have made the work that I'm making now without um, the knowledge and the support of other quilters. Mm. We have a question um, from the audience um, that mm -hmm. asks, uh, which artists inspire you in your practice? Uh, one of, uh, I'm sorry. From Marianne. Okay, thank you, Marianne. Um, I, growing in college, my professor was always into Rembrandt and Chiascaro. <laughs> and so I was very much a Rembrandt fan um, in college, and I would, um, lots of Rembrandts, lots of, um, and that's why you see a lot of dark imagery in my work, um, a lot of Marie Cassatt and the women holding children. Um, and then um, one artist that has impacted me probably the most is an artist named Tom Thieling. Um, uh, some people don't know him because he was a local artist in South Carolina but he was a, a, an illustrator um, and a graph, he used graphite. He has this book called Slave Ship. I wish I had an image of it now. But for me, like that was the first 
sort of book of pictures and images that sort of made me feel like I, I understood how art can make you feel by going through that book and looking at his images. I, there is so much emotion in his work. So was that book a catalyst for you wanting to be an artist or, you know, from, we have another question from Tamisha asking, you know, when did you know you wanted to be an artist? Was this something that you always loved? Was this kind of like a building block to this? Is this something from when you were a child? It was, uh, I, I, I don't think I chose to be an artist. I thought, I think it chose me. It started like being, being a child, being shy, not being talkative, being sort of very socially awkward. Um, the easiest way for me to communicate was through drawing and through painting. I was just not, uh, and so it became my means to communicating and it became, became my means of like, and it was something that people saw that I was good at. So mm. I, I really didn't have a choice in the matter. Um, mm. And luckily my, my mother was very supportive the whole way. She wasn't like, go and be a doctor or try and do something else. Um, they didn't know what artists were or, but uh, she supported me and everyone supported me throughout the, my journey, buying me crayons and color pencils. Um, but I don't really think it was a choice for me. And I don't think it's a choice for me. If I was still working where I, at a nine to five, like I'd still be making art on the side just because I have to do it. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to scroll through some of these WPA paintings? Yeah, so I, um, I put in three of them. What What is it about that period? Because WPA, I think that's post World War II. 19, uh, it's 1920, 1930, I think. Oh, so uh, one? Oh, my history's bad. <laughs> I remembered it when I made the work, but I don't remember it now. <laughs> um, but I, I think I was trying to, when I was making these works, I think it was me trying to get out of slavery because I spent a lot of time in slavery and slavery is very taxing emotionally for me, mm -hmm. like reading all of these narratives. Uh, mm -hmm. Harriet Tubman narrative, the um, incidents of a life of a slave girl was uh, like, it's just a very, I, I put a lot of emotional sort of labor into like making these works. Um, and so mm -hmm. I needed to sort of find the bridge, like the bridge okay. between the enslaved person and the free person. And all of these people were, um, um, their stories were recorded but they were all enslaved at one period of time. I can't exactly remember the stories now, but there was one painting that I had um, made of a woman and I don't have it in, in this um, group of three images, but it's from this series. Um, and it talked about how when she was captured, um, her, the guy that captured her when she was a child cut off all her hair, pretended like she was a boy to try and sell her. Um, to in some other town and it just went throughout her through her history and i was just like this is this is so much um and so this was me trying to find that 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 bridge that gap between the enslaved and the uh, so that's why i i chose that time period and that's why i chose these images um okay. and the resilience of these people and so Talking about information or a history that is taxing, how does that? How do you think about the contemporary moment now? What are the things that you're thinking about? What are the things you wanna, you are making work about? You have this show coming up in October at Debuck. Um, you know, you have the, the 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 unfortunate incident with the gentleman in Wisconsin. Like, how? How do you think about your practice and, and what it can offer us, even if it's levity in, in this moment? I, so it, it has been a lot. Um, and what I have learned is that I have to take it in doses. It's like, 
I can only have it from this part of the day, like not when I wake up. After like afternoon, that's when I watch or learn about the news. Um, and then the mornings are for my affirmations or my positive thinking. The afternoons are for learning news and learning who got shot and who got killed today. And the evenings are sort of like a mixture and sort of winding down. Um, and so when I make work now, I'm still thinking about um, like these past struggles, um, but how can I show the beauty and the resilience of people who experience these struggles? Um, mm. And struggle is not a thing that you have to, it's just something that we all have to deal with, but I still want to show the beauty in us that have to deal with it. And I hope that if people see my work like some get the meaning, but some may not. And what they see is just like a beautiful black person. Um, so if you look at, this is, these are the, um, the uh, coal, coal mine. Yeah. Um, but this is one, of, this is sort of my newest piece. Um, and we were talking about going through that, this sort of process. And I, I, and I felt like I needed to escape a little bit. So I've mm -hmm. been escaping through um, Negro spirituals. And so what I'm doing now is I'm taking Negro spirituals um, and I'm visualizing and creating these um, sort of magical, mystical images from the spirituals and the idea of, and again, in those spirituals, they come from slavery. It's a lot of hope. It's just a lot of resilience. Unfortunately, a lot of the hope comes through death in heaven, mm. um, but there is still that resilience. And so I'm still trying to make and create hope um, and resilience in the work that I'm making. And making these works are very meditative. It's been a, a slow process. So besides with the, with the recent work using Negro spirituals as a, a catalyst, and you've mentioned several times growing up Jehovah's Witness, how else does your faith, um, wherever you are spiritually right now, shine through in your work? I think, I mean, so I'm still at the searching. I And I know, I realize now that I will always be at the searching stage. Um, but I find faith in like literature and um videos that I watched, I've been starting to um, listen to um, A Real Turn to Love by Marianne Williamson. Mm. Yeah, the we were talking about that. Yeah, The <laughs> Courts of Miracles. Um, I used to listen to a lot of Yonla Van Zant. I actually did some workshops with her when she was here in DC. And so like going back to some of those old tapes that I would used to listen to and some of those lectures that I would used to listen to just to sort of um, to build my spirit and to realize the, the, the God and the goodness in me. Does that, did that answer your question? Yeah, no, totally. Yeah. Yeah. Can we um, scroll back to some just other examples of works? Cause maybe talk about this series. Cause I think this is also recent just so people can kind of see the spectrum of the oeuvre um, yeah. painting to quilting and this, these different series. Cause the one thing that, if I recall correctly, when you work in a series, the series is usually about 10 works, if I'm correct? Uh, oh, at least six. I always six create works. at least six works. So I guess series. if you can talk to us about this series, one, but then two, why um, have you decided or made the choice to keep the series kind of almost these intimate suites of paintings or quilts mm -hmm. as opposed to like 30 paintings about coal mining. Mm -hmm. what, what do you, what, what, what do you feel you achieve in kind of creating these suites versus kind of like a more expansive approach? Well, I, um, this is part of a series that I'm a larger group of works that I'm working on around the history of labor and work in the United States. And mm -hmm. so one section of history and labor is coal mining. Because um, the museum that I'm actually showing these works in is in Westmoreland, um, in Western Pennsylvania, 
Um, and I started to learn about, uh, as we had talked about a little bit earlier, coal mining, um, Mother Jones, who I had never, I heard the magazine Mother Jones and the website Mother Jones, but I had no idea that she was this fierce Irish woman who um, helped um, unionize miners. Um, she had a long tragic story, uh, but she was just this brave woman. And so, and learning about the mine wars um, and how race played into um, mining. So um, when you are in the mine, sort of like you're all the same person. Um, you're all people working together, sort of how soldiers talk about going to war um, in World War II, um, an earlier war. But as soon as you get out the mine, um, you're sectioned off in these different sections of coal mining towns. Um, so I wanted to focus specifically on black coal miners. Um, a lot of these um, faces came from old archival images of um, black coal miners um, mm -hmm. and put that um, idea of this is Americana, um, the flag behind them and the canary, the canary in the coal mine. So canary were used in these little um, sort of glass jars to test the air in the coal mining to see whether it was dangerous and sort of uh, use these canaries um, to show the spirit of safety around um, these coal miners. And again, it's a mixture of painting. The clothes are um, out of fabric. There's buttons, um, there's uh, metallic in it, and there's also mica flakes in the background. So they're, they're hard to see in the photo, but in uh, in person, there's sort of these billions. Is there another billion. one from the series that people can see? Um, this is one, two. And then I want to piggyback that notion of Americana because we were talking about that earlier um, because the flag um, appears prominently in a lot of your works. Um, I guess, how do you think about the flag as an object and symbol, particularly in relationship to Black people in this country? Because you'll have people who say that you know, uh, a lot of the things that black people work for, strive for, they were never really entitled to in the first place. Or was yeah. it designed for that? Yeah, I mean, and that's sort of like how I feel. Um, at going back, I always have to bring this up because it's so, it's just a part of my life growing up a Jehovah's Witness. You're not allowed to work, uh, salute the flag because mm. you're only supposed to like, um, show reverence for God, not for a flag or a nation. So my um, initial relationship with the, with the flag, my first sort of encounter was very violent. So in kindergarten, um, all, I just knew that I wasn't supposed to stand up for the flag. And so when we were in kindergarten and the Pledge of Allegiance would come in through the speaker, we were supposed to stand and salute the flag but I knew that I wasn't supposed to, so I sort of turned around and my kindergarten teacher would always grab me and yank me and sort of like try to pull me up and make me stand for the flag. Like you will stand for this flag. Um, and so it was sort of, it was traumatizing. <laughs> and so the, my first sort of um, um, the experience with the flag was very violent. Um, mm. And so I feel like me, Using, I use it a lot in my work is me coming to terms with that. The flag is, it is a symbol. It can be a symbol of violence, um, but it's also supposed to be a something you salute to, which um, is also imminent or, or reminiscent of this country. Hmm. But it's interesting, I mean, you sharing, thank you for sharing that story. Because it makes, it makes me think about, you know, Colin Kaepernick and, and how the NFL has kind of dealt with this saluting for the flag. Or even in the NBA, there was a um, Muslim basketball player, I think, in the 90s. Um, Chris Jackson is his American name, but he converted and, and, and assumed a Muslim name. And he used mm -hmm. to pray mm -hmm. during the um, national anthem. And he would get so much flack for it. Mm -hmm. um, but I think this period in general is unpacking a lot of truths about this country that I think a lot of people have been in denial about. Um, and, and 
want to pretend to be shocked, but it's like this is in the DNA. Yeah, yeah. Of this country, you know. Yeah, and I thought, and I think, sort of this time period, I mean, is sort of how I was able to come to turn, especially Kaepernick, was how I was able to come to terms with what had happened to me when I was five years old. It was like, okay, well, maybe she had somebody in the military and she, I mean, she wasn't a black woman. So she was, <laughs> she was I mean, so her relationship to the flag and her, and her trying to grab this little black boy and make him salute the thing that she holds so dear to her heart was yeah. um, like her way of controlling me. And so yeah. like, and, and, and it's the same sort of narrative with uh, Kaepernick um, um, and all of the NFL protests. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to be mindful of time. Um, maybe we can scroll through some more images. We do have some questions. Um, one question um, from Sanzi. Um, she's glad that you referenced Tom Feelings. Um, it's imperative to educate you know, viewers on kind of lesser known artists. Um, are there any other artists you can speak about um, that have influenced yeah. your work that might, might be have, have been lesser known? Yeah, um, so S.B. Frazier, a local artist um, who um, makes beautiful portraits. Um, I love her work. Um, growing up in college, not growing up in college, but when I went to college, that was when I was surrounded by black artists. So there is a um, uh, Tyrone Jeter. He was a teacher at Benedict College. Um, and like um, Tom Feeling, he has like these beautiful, amazing um, drawings on like torn up pieces of paper. Uh, if you haven't seen any of his work, you should definitely look up his work. Um, and um, a, another artist from Charleston, area that has made it really big is this artist named Jonathan Green. Um, and he was sort of the first artist that I saw that was sort of like famous. Um, mm. And um, yeah, it was, a, and then just being surrounded by um, artists, my best friend Quincy Pugh um, in Columbia um, painted portraits and he makes beautiful work. Um, and I feel like he was the person that really believed in me the most. Um, and first, and, and he was the one, Quincy Pugh is the one who put my work out there and, and, and encouraged me to exhibit work. Um, mm. so it's a, it's a lot of, um, not everybody is big, but, and then I started, uh, after I graduated, I was, I, and out of university, I was able to explore black artists. Um, so yeah, it's a lot, a lot of people. Cool. Um, so this piece, can you talk to a little, talk to us a little bit about this piece? Because I look at this and I think about Horace Pippen, um, who has a piece at the Barnes Foundation. But then I think about Starry Night. I know you've mentioned other artists who inspire you, but do you, from a composition standpoint, look at other artists to kind of inspire how you situate subjects in your painting? Or is it kind of more looking at archival images, or is it your imagination? Uh, it sure. is, a lot of it is my training at the University of South Carolina and my professor David Boros, and him talking about composition. All my compositions are triangles. If, mm -hmm. if somebody looks in my work, they will always see like a triangle, and my I'm trying to make the eye go a certain way. Um, this work is from the series that I did about Harriet Tubman. Um, she had been hit in the head by a two pound weight when she was young. And from that, she developed this uh, condition where she would fall asleep at any time, like escaping slavery, fall asleep at any time. She had terrible headaches uh, and visions. And so this piece is an image of um, her having one of these um, visions and sort of these three wise women um, looking over her and letting her experience that. Um, because people always knew that when she was having these visions, well, not always knew, but that when she had these visions, she uh, 
these sleeping spells, she would wake up with a vision. Hmm. And that, that, that for me is a fascinating fact because when you mentioned it to me previously, because I think Harriet exists in the imaginary, you know, being this fierce woman who, you know, led all these slaves to freedom, but not even really realizing she had a medical condition. Yeah, I, I had no idea until I read that. I, the, the one thing that shocked me was that she was a cougar and she married a much younger man when she was in her 40s. She married a man. She was like 40 something and he was like 20 something. People were like kind of weirded out about it. Um, but their, <laughs> love, their love lasted for a very long time. Um, how she was influential in the women's movement. Um, mm-hmm. She was in the, uh, and how influ- she was a scout during the Civil War. She helped mm-hmm. uh, the Union soldiers uh, free over 700 enslaved people and a part of Beaufort, South Carolina. How she mm-hmm. rescued each of her family members, um, her mother and dad in old age, and how she, um, her brothers and sisters um, and nieces and nephews, like it, it, it's shocking and unbelievable that this um, small person um, could do all the work that she did do. Mm, mm. Um, maybe we could slide through vi- some more images. We have a question that asked, um, what advice do you have for emerging artists in Baltimore? Um, that's from Victoria. And I guess to piggyback that question, um, do you mentor other young artists just kind of based on the experience and uh, that you've been able to garner through your practice, which is from Jackie, Jacqueline. I um, I have been working with an artist from Tuskegee, Hillary Cyrus. She's been uh, working with me during the summers. She just approached me at the um, at a show, and I was like, I don't really mentor people, but you can <laughs> help out. Um, and so she's been a wonderful studio assistant whenever she has. Um, time to come, um, but I just haven't. Um, I just haven't done. I did that a lot at, at Micah when I worked at Micah, but mm-hmm. um, since I've left, I just haven't been able to be as um, out in the world as I want to, just because the work that I make is so time consuming. But I should. should. <laughs> and then I guess for not even just emerging artists, artists in general, because we know that there's no specific formula for success, but I guess what have been the important things that have helped you continue to move forward in your journey? So we know one was surrounding yourself with people who who believe in you as much as you believe in yourself, for example. Um, two seems like you know a deep commitment to research, whatever that is, whether it's literature, our art history, but are there other things that, you know, are essential, um, at least for success within your practice? I think the realization for me that everything take, takes time. So with Instagram, the name instant comes up, but nothing is ever instant. And so I have to continually remind myself that this is not, I'm not instantly going to be able to make work. I'm not instantly going to be able to reach success. It like everything happens in increments. And even if I didn't have the success that I have had recently, like um, it, it all takes time. Um, and the thing that I would, the sort of advice that I would give to artists is like sort of like what you said is like be gentle to yourself. Um, work with what you have. Like the work that I make now, this piece here, I could have never made um, because the materials were so expensive. Mm. Um, the, uh, the tools that I use are so expensive. Like I, would, I could not financially afford to make the work that I make now uh, three years ago. Um, so it's just working with what you have um, and being and being okay with that, like this is what I have to work with, make something beautiful out of it, um, and just be okay with that. Mm. And and what's the name of this piece? Could you talk to us a little bit about this, and then I'll address another question that's in the comments. 
Um, this piece is uh, We Shall, I forget, but this is one of, <laughs> I, I, shall, something with the Kahamdi. I can't uh, remember the name. But again, this is a Harriet Tubman piece. This um, is uh, sort of taking the image of Washington crossing the Delaware um, mm -hmm. and using that image for um, Harriet Tubman when she helped the uh, Union soldiers um, free um, enslaved people in Beaufort, South Carolina. And I mm -hmm. always say my work is sort of magical imagery. This is not an accurate representation of what that boat looked like. Um, mm -hmm. This is not an accurate representation necessarily what she have been what she would have been dressed in. Um, it's sort of a magical way of re of imagining that time period. Mm. And that's also um, so I'm pointing at it like you can see me pointing at it. That's also <laughs> um, one of the first time uh, an important time where they used the whole scorched earth. Um, um, mm -hmm. tactic in war oh, in um, okay, during that time period. Um, they burned a lot of, uh, of the fields that the enslaved people were working on. And when they saw that when they were going out to work and that that stuff had been burned down, um, they ran out to the Union soldiers and got on those boats and escaped um, their slave masters. Mm. And then I want to just get into a technical thing because I know there's an artist in here. Can you talk to us about um, the composition of these paintings being in a triangle and what that means? Um, it's hard for me to say without to being able to point things out. Um, I, I or the philosophy th around it. I think the sort of um, concept is like everything is. A, I'm trying to. S say it in a, a good way, but everything is a form. Your eyes are always drawn to things because something is sh um, is um, is telling you that's where your eye should go. I think a perfect show for that is The Handmaid's Tale. Every shot in that show is thought out and it tell and that that show tells you exactly where your eyes want to go in every scene mm. with um, light and it does it with light. And so, and that's a good, I guess, piggyback to this question from Nessa. Um, with a lot of American education being from a white perspective, what advice would you give to artists of color seeking to unlearn the whitewashing of history, white supremacy, bias in art and education? Because um, it seems like you've had to unlearn a lot of things, discover things, and then take those discoveries and then inject that into the work. So I guess what advice would you give to artists who are trying to also make those discoveries and un un unlearn the things that um, really aren't affirming, not only as an artist, but then as a person of color? I mean, we have the internet now. The internet is magic. Like I remember before the internet and I would not be able to have learned the stuff that I learned now without the internet. So mm -hmm. um, what? Like it's like the like I said, Google knows your al algorithm. If you start looking up black artists and you start going to your their pages, um, it'll say you might like this person, and then you start getting introduced to different books about black artists. Like you, it's it, it's a process. It's a learning, and it's not something that um, that you're just gonna get. It's a unfortunately, it's hard work. Um, so you have to sort of put in the hard work to to. To, to find these people. Okay. And luckily we're at a time, I think, where more people are talking about black artists. Um, current. But how, do, but how do you feel about that, right? Because like, um, I have some friends in the chat who, who wonder if it's a trend, is it a shift? I mean, if you look at all the September issues, Amy's on Vanity Fair, Carrie's on Vogue, Jordan's on Vogue, um, how does that make you feel as an artist outside of the practice? Like, do you feel that this is an indicator of a shift or is this capitalism taking advantage of where the consciousness is? I think it's um, so, uh, capitalism a lot. Um, mm. And it's a, everything's a trend. Mm. Unfortunately, everything is a trend. And now it's sort of um, our time to say that we are not a trend and um, we matter. And so I'm trying to say it in what little way that I have now. Um, mm. 
I can spend my time being angry that it is this way. Um, but for me personally, it's not going to bring out the work. The work mm -hmm. is like, it. this exists now, I'm going to make the work and I'm going to put it out there. Mm -hmm. and but it is a trend. <laughs> maybe we could scroll through a couple of images and then I'll have one last question um, from Morel. Micah Grad representing Miami. Um, Danny, Danny says he's called <laughs> the trend. I disagree. I think it's a, I think it's a hybrid. I mean, it obviously is taking advantage of the climate, but I think if you look at like Vanity Fair, you know, a black woman on the cover of a magazine is not necessarily going to sell more magazines. No. And now there's a publication. That album, that will, that will sell a lot of magazines. ta Coates and Amy Sherrill. That special issue, like, yeah. I that mean, is a special, that is a very special issue. I'd be, I mean, I'd be curious to look at the numbers. Yeah. Year yeah, over yeah. year, September image issue to just see. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. Because also you have to remember they're following up with Viola Davis on the cover. Um, and so I think it could be a trend, it could be a shift, but I think it's important, as you said, to just hold people accountable that we matter. Yeah. And like, okay, so how do we get more people of color behind the scenes, editing, writing? You know, I think I forget what magazine. There was another magazine that just hired their first black photographer. You know, how how do we now insert ourselves more into the creative process mm -hmm. and not just kind of the byproduct? Yeah. So I I think it's a little bit of, a little bit of both, but um, yeah, I guess we can scroll through some more images and then because um, I I want to be mindful of time. Um, Morel had a question on how can we support you. What's up, Kilolo? Uh, what's up, Danny? What's hey. up, Morel? Um, how uh, can you, people learn more about your work? Tell us about the show in October at the Buck. I, so, I know there's some collectors sneaking in 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 this room. People who want to purchase. So the uh, <laughs> um, you can support me by going to my Instagram, Stephen Towns. Um, and sharing my work with people. That's how you can support me. Um, I have a mm. show opening. I have it written down here. October 15th through November the 28th um, at the Buck, and it's the spiritual show that we talked about, a songbook remembered. Um, mm. So I created some really, I guess I'm going to say it, I feel like they're beautiful. <laughs> um, some stunning quilts. Um, I feel like they were all inspired um by by god by something um mm. i had hillary come and she was able to help for like two weeks and like just be so helpful like it was like god the spirit like the being like being over me and um giving me the inspiration for this work um mm. and i'm really excited to uh be able to show it can't show mm. the swimming images is uh uh the only one that's okay the song, deep river yeah um and it's just um i wish i could people can experience in person i know it's gonna be at the uh, gallery in october um so if and you're then, in new york you'll be able to see it in person one last question that i should have addressed earlier um there was a mm -hmm. question about your journey from I guess being a free agent to working with the gallery, what has that been like in general without kind of getting into specifics? And what are things that artists should keep in mind who are who are looking to make that um, move? Because I think a lot of artists want representation and don't really understand what that means or right. haven't really identified potential galleries that they can work with because I look at galleries as a, a business partner mm -hmm. and not a savior. Um, so I guess as someone who had to, you know, make it work at every step of the way, I guess, what are your thoughts on that? And I guess what could you offer artists who are trying to like navigate that? Um, I think it's sort it's challenging to navigate. Yeah, I mean it is a, a business. It's a partnership. Um, and uh, 
you have to be, I think that um, having a gallery has been able to free me personally so that I can spend more time um, working on the work. Um, and uh, a lot of it is sort of like access. They have access to people that I would never meet because um, they are gallery. They have access to organizations that I would never get access to. It's sort of like you, as an actor, you need a publicist to um, put your work out there because if you're just going out there saying, here's my work, it's harder for people to, to they're not, a lot of times people don't take you as seriously. Mm. At least from my experience and being a black artist, I mean, that I think people have to, or I, you have to take things in a time period. With Instagram, things have changed. Yeah. But I, I come from the generation before Instagram. <laughs> I'm 40 years old now. This is I'm for I just turned 40 this year. So Man, like, I just turned 42. Don't yeah. make 40 sound old. That's young. We so, just get yeah, started. But, but I'm just like <laughs> I'm just saying like I'm not a 20 year old, 20 year old successful artist. Like I have it's been a long process. Yeah. Yeah. And I think how um I guess have you communicated with any galleries that show your work about the importance of black collectors also having access to the work? Because what typically happens, as we know, as the price point elevates, you know, the persuasion of the purchasers seems to change. Mm -hmm. And so I guess how do you think about that when you're making work and you're making things available to galleries? You know, yeah. whether it's your New York gallery or whoever. I mean, I've had works that I have specified. I can think of one in particular that I would say like this has to go to a black person. Like mm -hmm. it just, or, and this work has to go to an institution. Nobody, mm -hmm. uh, individual can't have this work. It has to go to an institution. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so just being able to communicate that and saying, um, and being comfortable with that. So if it doesn't go, if it doesn't get sold, then it doesn't get sold. Mm. Um, but it's, I mean, it's challenging. Nothing is, nothing's easy. Yeah. I'm from the South. I'm black. Yeah. Nothing is easy. Nothing <laughs> is easy. And I think it's important that like we, we, we articulate that because I think people don't see the years of work you've put in. Like your name has been in the zeitgeist for years, right? And it's just like, unfortunately, until it's put in certain contexts, people don't really move as from a collector standpoint. Yeah. Right? You know, it's not till you do the show at Art and Practice in LA with Mark Bradford where people are like, oh shit. Yeah. This dude's popping. Yeah. Um, and so I guess this is my last question because I know we're over time. How does that? motivate you you know just the times where people have maybe overlooked discredit i mean the fact that you're working in painting but then also in quilting um does that ever get to you or do you just are like f them this is, yeah. this is my talent I mean, they got. <laughs> i'm not i'm not I'm a human being so things yeah. hurt i mean things hurt if i don't get something yeah. then things hurt um, yeah. And I'm not going to pretend like it doesn't hurt. Um, and then I move on. Because, I, I mean, I, I'm sort of at the age, if I were in my early 20s or my late 20s, I probably would feel some way about a lot of things and a lot of people. But, like, now in my 30s, I learned that there are some things that I just have to sort of let go of. Let go mm -hmm. and let God, as they say in the church. And so yeah, yeah. I try to, um, I try to live by that. And I, reading this Marianne Wil Williamson Return to Love book has helped a lot. Yeah, but they, we can talk I, about that. Yeah, about sort of the idea of like, um, bless this. Like, usually when somebody says "bless your heart," that's like uh, <laughs> they're saying "f you." <laughs> <laughs> but like now, I I if there are people that are sort of uh, that I have a bad energy from or like something has happened, 
like um, I'm starting to like physically uh, or mentally sort of bless these people in my mind and to want goodness for people. Um, and that's a lot what I've learned. That's what I've learned from reading or, or listening to that book and listening to some of her talks. But I'm still a human being. So, I mean, I still feel things and uh, it's just acknowledging them up acknowledging them mm. and so there you have it people october solo show in new york at the buck um and when's the westmoreland show do you know it Was is that? gonna happen in 2022 so okay. january 2022 okay so if you're in western pennsylvania Yep, it's right outside of Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh, right outside of Pittsburgh. Like Kilolo in the house, Pittsburgh in the house. Yes. Um, I want to thank you, Stephen, for your time. This has been thank an incredible you. conversation and hopefully the first of many more. Yes. Um, thank you to Kirk. Thank you, Jackie, Kyrie, um, the Baltimore Office of Promotion and the Arts uh, for providing this platform for us to have a conversation and dialogue. This virtual Artist Cafe series is incredible. Um, more to come. I'm Larry Ose Mensa. This is Monsieur Stephen Towns. Thanks. Thank you again. You. Enjoy your evening. Uh, be well. Be blessed. Thanks. I feel like Tavis Smiley. <laughs> <laughs> well, <Peace>. not him. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, not him. Two <laughs> <A> million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness, that was amazing. Thank you to Larry and Stephen for a riveting conversation this evening. And thank you all for joining us tonight. Join us again this week for our finale artist talk live in the Atelier with fashion designer Bishmay Kamrati. The talk will take place at 7 p.m. right here this Thursday evening. BOPA is continuing to bring the art in August with our first ever online artist market featuring 75 local and regional vendors. Shop, explore, and support over the next six days. More information on how to access the online market can be found on our website. Check out the B2020 exhibition in our online gallery featuring works from some of the best in Baltimore. The exhibition is running now through the end of October. And this coming Sunday is our last pop-up exhibition in partnership with the Hot Sauce Collaborative featuring artist McKinley Wallace. The finale exhibition will take place from 1 to 3 p.m. at 1706 North Charles Street, Baltimore, Maryland. Information about all of our upcoming programs and events can be found on our website at www.promotionandarts.org. Thank you again, Larry and Stephen, for an amazing conversation this evening. And thank you all again for watching. Have a wonderful night. Good night.